Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, look, let's just get right into the topic of the day. I don't know if you were able to pick up the Oregonian today, the Sunday Oregonian, but uh, in the commentary section of the Oregonian, normally the editorial section or whatever, that was quite an article that was written by uh, Rick Sutterstein. And uh, it, the top of the headline it was said, Close Encounters of the Racist Kind. Very interesting. Close Encounters of the Racist Kind. I read the first paragraph, and then, then we'll just then we'll go from there, and then I'll introduce my my guest here today. There is perhaps nothing more difficult to talk about in our country than race and racism. The Zimmerman verdict forced open an important discussion, but it has often been so academic that it is little more than an intellectual exercise in what race is, or so slanted that racism is mainly portrayed as a problem that people who are not black have to overcome. It goes on and on and on, but there are some other points in there. We'll, we'll probably bring these, these points up and whatever. But uh, uh, Rick, by the way, is a professor of social and behavioral health sciences at Oregon State University. It just seems as though his, uh, my reaction to the article is that um, he and his partner, who happened to be gay, uh, basically adopted two kids and uh, who happened to be black. They are white. And, I, and to a certain degree, I, I, I think he was kind of like reaching out in this article because things were happening and he's trying to figure out what do I do and so the only thing I could come up with um, uh, from my reaction um, uh, in my and my encounters was the fact that I basically said um, biases of gays latching on to biases of blacks and it's pretty harsh folks but but we need to talk about harshness at this point in time because we need solutions okay racism is an issue I've said it on the show before, and I'm saying it again today, but we can get to the promised land in terms of resolution, and that's what we need to do. The more we talk about it, put it on the table, and then thank goodness for President Obama for bringing it to the, to the table, because that's exactly what it's all about. <coughs> We're talking about these issues. So my guest today, who I thought I'd bring to the table, because she has the background. She has the background. She's she's local, and uh, she's talking to these, these issues of racism and whatever here locally here in the Portland metropolitan area, which is a, which is Portland metropolitan, metropolitan, metro, uh, Multnomah County, the like. I mean, this is basically the most liberal part of, of Oregon. And you would think we wouldn't have any issues right here, in the, especially in Multnomah County in the city of Portland, by no means. So anyway, uh, Donna Maxey, I, I don't know if you've, you've heard of the Maxey clan. I have. I mean, I, I, I met Mr. Maxey when I was in the Marine Corps and as a recruiter, and, and he sat down and chatted with me. He said, boy, sit down here. Let me talk to you about this piece. He was prior military, and, and he was very familiar with that. And it was really uh, very interesting. He sort of gave me some guiding lights, if you will, on how to deal with the, with the state of Oregon, more specifically in Portland. And I really want to thank him for that. He's not with us today, but guess who I have with me today? I have his daughter, one of his daughter, one of his, one of his siblings, and that is Donna Maxey. And uh, just so happened, we're going to get a little bit more about her background and whatever. But anyway, she's got an organization that she's, she's put together, and it's called Race Talks, Uniting, Uniting to Break the Chains of Racism. An opportunity for dialogue. Race talks uniting to break the change <coughs> of racism. Okay, and we'll get a little bit more about, about that piece, but welcome, Donna. Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. You were here last week, you know, with, with the rest of the guys, right? Yeah. But now I want Hanging to, out with the dudes. That's right, but because of this issue right here, I mean, all Oregonians are looking at this. As you know, we're, we're one newspaper state, if you will, the right. Oregonian, and everyone is reading it. They're trying to figure out what and why and what this person was talking to. I basically tell you what basically what my, my thoughts were. But uh, what we're going to do, they, they made a couple of points about about education. And I thought that right. was very key. And I know that you've been spending quite a bit of your time in the education arena, basically starting this whole piece of race talks. And you've got some partners involved in that, as I read your brochure and whatever. And we'll just go on and get into that. So why don't we just go in that, that way by basically saying, first off, Let's talk a little bit about your background again. Let's talk about the Maxi, the Maxi clan, and, the, and your background a bit. Yeah. Well, um, my parents are from Texas. Texas. Uh, from East Texas. Um, what part of what part of East Texas? They're from um, 
Kilgore. Kilgore. Kilgore, Texas. Kilgore in Longview, Texas. which is Longview. very close to Shreveport. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, small towns. My mom always claimed that she had the best of all worlds because she was raised in the rural area, which yep. means that she, they lived on a farm, so yep. she knew everything the farm girls knew and plus kind of knew how to live in a t city too. Mm -hmm. And my dad was from uh, Longview, and that was an oil town and, you know, had all the issues that towns with a lot of money mm -hmm. have. So um, they got together in college. They met at Texas College and were sweethearts and eloped their sophomore year um, and got married in October and finally came out at the end of the school year when her mother said she needed to come home. She goes, no, no, no I'm married now. So uh, they were married for 62 years. 62 years. Yeah, I had five kids. And uh, my father was a teacher in the South and uh, they decided they wanted to leave the South and my mom said uh, whenever we go, wherever we go, I want my kids to have the opportunity to be involved in everything that there is. And uh, so she had lived next to a park and because she was an African American, she was black, Negro colored, mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. whatever yeah, the right, definition right, is, yeah. the N word, right. she didn't get to go into the park. And so she said she wanted to make sure that her kids had yeah, those opportunities. This was in, in Kilgore. Kilgore. Yeah. So uh, they came to Oregon and um, my father joined the Republican Party and how they, when did they, uh, they right? came in about 1942, 1942 I think it was wow. maybe 43 my, my dad is is a very was a very independent person you know most he was part of the they were part of the great migration mm -hmm. leaving the south the greatest mm -hmm. migration of people I think it was on the face of the earth uh, who left the south and went to the north and now it's reversing and going back mm -hmm. but um, most black people went east so my dad said, I'm going west. Mm -hmm. Most black folks went to California, so he said, I'm going north. Most black folks went to Washington, so he said, I'm going to Oregon. Did he do the shipyard deal when he was uh, that, He that, did that, for that a short while. Um, when he first started, when he first left the South, mom and dad, um, my sister, I think, had been born by this time, and he, le he left and went to Utah and worked in the munitions yards during the war and mm -hmm. then um, got put out of there because he didn't know his place and um and and left and then came back got my mom and then they moved to Oregon and one of the things that he did that I always thought was interesting most black people joined the democratic party so he joined the republican party well most blacks were republican during that particular well, time and many of them many yeah, many, many were many, yeah. and so he um he was a contemporary of Mark Hatfield and Clay Myers and um and one particular gentleman i remember was uh, Bill English Bill in Bill Ireland. Bill Ireland. There was a Bill English, and mm -hmm. he was African-American, mm -hmm. but there was Bill Ireland, who was white, and he was in the uh, legislature, and we used to go down, they lived in Malala, and we used to go down to their home in Malala mm -hmm. every 4th of July, and mm -hmm. go to the Malala Buckaroo, and, mm -hmm. and hang out with them, so, um, and plus, Daddy played golf. So there were always many people of different ethnicities coming and going in our family, in our home, mm -hmm. and, um, and my parents were the kind who believed that your kids should know what they're involved in. So if there was some meeting, you were likely to see me at the meeting or my, mm -hmm. my sisters or brothers, whoever wanted to go. We were involved and part Did, of that. Were they teaching, teaching units in there? Well, when Daddy came north, he applied for a teaching position, and they said no. They were concerned that this young black buck would be teaching helpless white girls, and so mm -hmm. they were concerned that he would uh, have s sexual proclivities. Oh. And mm -hmm. so they would not hire him. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you know the story of the first African-American mm -hmm. who got hired in Portland. Okay. That was Mr. Ford, um, who was the, the father of Bobby Nunn, okay. who was a teacher in Portland Public right. Schools and was married to Joe Nunn, who was a uh, Joe Nunn Sr., who was a teacher here in the district and administrator. And their son, Joe Jr., was a, um, a teacher. But uh, Mr. Ford... Who's still Ford, here. Who's still doing, here. Doing his thing, yeah. But Mr. Ford... Uh, saw that there were positions open he already lived here so what he did is he filled out the application sent for an application from his college which was back east and they sent an application portland sent an application back east the college sent the application to him he filled it out sent the resume back to his college and they sent it to portland portland sent him a contract to the college. Hadn't seen him yet. Hadn't seen him. And the college <laughs> sent the contract to him. He signed it, kept his copy, sent it back to the college, who sent it back to Portland. Yes. So all of this is doing this little triangular kind of yes, thing, right. you know. And uh, so when school started, he first day of school for teachers, 
he yeah, showed he up. Yeah. I go, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I have a contract. And there it was, you know. So what are they going to say? Um, you know. What school was that then? I don't in remember what school. It was here in Portland Public mm -hmm, Schools. Mm -hmm, I don't remember mm -hmm. uh, which particular school it was. Okay. But they have honored Mr. Ford by naming the auditorium at Jefferson High School after Mr. Ford. Okay, okay. Even though he never taught at Jefferson. Right, right, right. But. You know, I, I love that story. Yeah, I mean, story. that is just typical of what we have to go through mm -hmm. and what what we will do to get to our goal. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do what you have to do. You know, it's kind of interesting you talked about naming something after a person that's gone past to like Mr. Ford. I, I, you would think maybe the administration building, you know, something renowned, a little bit more renowned. My thought comes just recently, um, uh, former commissioner Charles Jordan, as you know, he did many things here in the Portland metro area, one of which was the Pioneer Square. Right. Pioneer Square. But when it came to naming something after him, they put him up in the, I, I call it back of the bus, and put him up in the North Portland aspect of it. Should have been downtown at the, the so-called living room suite of Portland. That's that was it, it was recognized as a, and it's a little disappointing, but um, I just wanted to make, point, make that point. Well, across. you know, it, it's kind of like uh, Dr. Charles Drew, who yes. came up with the process for uh, developing blood plasma. Mm -hmm. And he was, the way he died, he was in a car accident, and the White Hospital wouldn't accept him in, and mm -hmm. he bled to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it came time to name someplace after him, um, the Portland Red, the Oregon Red Cross named the lunchroom in his honor. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I don't know what he had to do with the lunchroom, but that's what they named after him was the lunchroom. So, you know, I guess the bottom line is we get our foot in the door. Yeah. This generation, you know, Dr. Drew's generation was, was dying because he couldn't be accepted in. Now we're getting in the door. We're getting named to the outpost. So every generation will improve, hopefully. Right, right, okay. All right, now we, got, we talked about the origin. Uh, what about your, well, you talk, we talked about your education, right? You, no, you not really. Um, I, 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 went to, I, like to, I always like to say I went to all the best ghetto schools here in Portland. Okay. Um, I went to Boyce Elliott for kindergarten, and my first and, and really only African-American teacher until I went to college was Sadie Grimet, hmm. who was my kindergarten teacher, and I loved dearly. Um, and then I went to Elliott School. I was in the first, first grade classroom. What year classroom. is that about? Gosh, yeah. um, let me see. 19, 1953 53. was when I went to, 52, 53 was when I went to Boyce because I was four years old when I went mm -hmm. to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I kind of cheated. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and uh, my mother was PTA president. And my, I was always up there at the school anyway, hanging out in the <laughs> kindergarten. So I said, put her in the class. <laughs> so, uh, and then I went to Elliott. I think that would have been, by that time I was five, so that would have been probably 54. Mm -hmm. And um, was in, did first through fifth grade at Elliott. Um, and happened to be the Rose Festival princess when I was in, I think, fourth grade. Sharon Gary, another yep, local Sharon, girl. Yep, Sharon, Sharon was, was Rose Festival princess for Elliott in third grade. And then, um, then I went to Highland School, which is now King mm -hmm. School, for sixth through eighth grade. My folks got a grocery store up in the, um, what's now the Humboldt community. And so uh, we moved up there and then went to Jefferson High School and left Jefferson, graduated from Jefferson, and then went to Pacific University. So, um, born and educated here locally. Oh, good, good. And then your career then took off. You went with your teacher then? Uh, I became a teacher. I was an elementary school major and music minor and was hired in California, in Oroville, California, as the first and only African-American teacher, one of only three in the county, in Butte wow. County. California. Yeah, in California in 1970. California. California. Wow. That's north. Butte County is northeast of Sacramento mm -hmm. County. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Then what? Came back? Well, I was there. Um, got married. Got divorced. Had a child. Not, not in that order. But, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and uh, stayed there for a while. And then in 85, came back to Portland and stayed for uh, about five years. Worked, came back and taught in Portland Public Schools for about five years. What and, about? What um, well, when I came back, I taught at Rose City Park School, okay. and okay. I had asked to teach at an African-American school, okay. um, and they placed me at Rose City Park, and I remember going for my first interview with the principal um, and said, 
wow, how many, how many African Americans are here? And he said, oh, about 15 or 20. I said, 15 or 20. I said, what percent? And I, yeah. he said, 15 or 20 yeah. percent. Wow, this community uh, has you, really changed, you, did, you yeah, know? Okay. He goes, no, I mean 15 or 20. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Uh, and so, you know, he goes, well, we need good African American yeah. role models for yeah. our children too. I'm like, mm, yeah. I think I need to be at a black school. But, you know, I, that was my preference. At, at that time, they were really recruiting for blacks, weren't they? Were it not, was Dr. Dr. Matt Prophet, Prophet. And Prophet, he Matt definitely, was, in yes. fact, he's the one who recruited me here. Okay. He's the one who recruited me. And he Matt called was an him African -American personally. Right? He, he was an African American. Uh, he had been in the military right, and right. Um, well. in Michigan. Still lives. Still he's here. still living. He, Dr. Prophet was sweetie. He was, he was an amazing man. He, yeah. I put him in the same category with my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, so. so I taught um, in Portland for three years. Dropped out. Decided I wanted to go back into sales. I had dropped out earlier in California, so I went into copier sales for a mm -hmm. while. Did that for a year, started getting bored, and said, I need to go back to my first love, which is teaching. Were we at IBM or Xerox? Wasn't it? No, uh, here I was in, with Xerox in California for uh, a year or two, but here I worked for American Business Machines. Okay. They were a local company. Mm -hmm. And then went to back to the school district, and Dr. Prophet said, okay, I have project for you, a couple of projects. And so the project was to be the loaned executive for... Um, for United Way, so I did hmm. that for a few really? months, and then stepped into the uh, position of career coordinator for the Mesa Mathematics Engineering Science Achievement Program, okay. which now they call it STEM hmm. programs. So um, that was really great, and while I was in that position, I happened to meet a gentleman who was the statewide director of Mesa for California, and mm -hmm. swept me off my feet, and I got married and left and went to California <laughs> again. <laughs> okay, so. okay, okay, all right, that happens. So, hey, what can that I happens. say? Yeah. I've been in California twice following husbands, yeah, so what right, can I right. say? Okay, okay, so now you're, you're back. I'm back, and... Okay. Uh, t and have retired. I taught in Portland Public. Um, actually, I taught in West Lynn for a year when really? I first came back, and that was that That's was quite interesting. interesting. Um, what was interesting was me going out to apply out there, and I'd have people say to me, you know, I thought Portland had maybe changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, well, I, with all this time gone by, I would think that black people would be outside of the city limits of Portland, mm -hmm. and so I needed a job. Mm -hmm. I didn't care where I taught, so I went and applied all around, and I figured the more opportunities I had for an interview, the more opportunity I would have for a job. So mm -hmm. I got hired in Westland for a year. That was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. um, the parents loved me, mm -hmm. except for one or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the rest of them, I've never had such parental support in a classroom mm -hmm. before. Um, quick. And these were all African American families? No, it? these were all white people. Oh, I see. These were all I white families. Okay, yeah, and what yeah. was so interesting um, is that I have one child, one little boy, who um, has stayed in touch. He and his family have right. stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. That was back in, I think it was 97 that I taught there, 97, 98. And uh, he invited me to his high school graduation party. I was really touched mm. by that. And sent me a, an invitation, sent me an announcement for his college graduation, and just sent me another announcement that he had gotten his master's. Wow, wow. So they've stayed wow. in touch. Wow. So Innocent. it's, it's uh, you know, you just never know how you touch someone's mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, okay, now we, we've basically gone throughout, basically, uh, your background, your origin, your education, your career, and whatever we want to talk. I want to make, make sure that the that the viewing artists get a good feel of your background when we talk about the whole issue of racism. And I'm a retired mostly, teacher now. And you're a retired teacher yes, now. Yes, I mean, after 35 plus exactly. years of teaching. And this issue of racism is really out there, and people tend not don't want to talk about it, this, that, and the other. So I thought it was very important to really, really, really do an extensive background check, if you will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because make sure you get, get qualified. So, you, so let, you me, say, let me say this. If you really want to know how qualified yeah, I am, on, part of the on. time when I was in California, I left teaching and okay. I worked in the California State Legislature oh, okay. and um, and in the governor's office and was the manager for the state of California in one of the offices there and uh, the was a trainer. Was a uh, Jerry Brown was Jerry governor Brown. then oh, yeah. okay. and um, worked in the uh, Office of Economic Opportunity as a manager in the training unit and so I trained adults, adult uh, community action agency boards up and down the state of California. Okay. So did that for a while and 
and again decided I was bored after I'd had that experience and went back to teaching. Yes. So, um, but I've I've had experience outside of the classroom, and that's when I worked for Xerox too, when I was in probably about a five year period. Oh, good, good. Okay, so, good. Uh, but I'm retired from teaching. I've been Thank retired you. two years. Now all of a sudden, race talks come in. How did you get into Xerox? How did this evolve? Well. I've been involved. Was that already was that an already established entity or was it? No, it was okay. not. Um, I've been something involved with the issue of race. I'm 64. I've been involved yeah. for 64 right. years. Okay. Um, but how I really got into race talks is um, they had opened up the Chapel Pub and Chris Poole, who Chapel is Chapel Pub of uh, McMinniman. McMinniman's okay. Chapel Pub, and they invited some community people. Chris pool it called me up and said hey they want to talk to people from the community who've been here and I thought of you and would you come and talk so being the shy retiring type I came and said exactly what I thought about race relations here in Portland and how things had gone in this community and um, so this the historian Tim Hills I don't know for people who haven't been to McMinniman's but um, it's a really neat place and one of the things they do is they buy old buildings and fix them up <coughs> But this is the one in Excuse northeast me. Portland, right? Yes, it's uh, on K northeast, North Killingsworth. Okay. And they fix up the building, and they mm -hmm. try to, to impart some of the historical background of the community mm -hmm. in the buildings. So he was talking to us and and uh, called me up. This was, I think, late summer. And then early January, called me up and said, we're doing History Pub, Urban Renewal, Urban Removal. And we'd like for you to speak, uh, you know. And so I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And um, and so part of my speaking skills is that not only was I a trainer, but I also competed it for Toastmasters. Okay. So okay. I was involved yeah, in Toastmasters. Okay. So yeah, I've, yeah. I've done a few You've things. Been out there, yeah, yeah. So, um, and so I spoke, and people were moved to make comment about it. I kind of told the emotional side of what happened to our family, our community, that when they came in and, you know, brought in the, the Memorial Coliseum and the, the Blanchard Education School yeah. building and, and uh, Lloyd Center, how the black community was just decimated. I mean, we lost our church. My dad lost his business. We lost our home. We lost our community. I just happened to run into somebody in the last year that I hadn't seen for over 50 years. Hmm. Wow. So, um, you know, a little boy who lived around the corner, we used to play together. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's one of those things where, um, and, and I, I tried to figure out how to get the point across about what was this community like? What mm -hmm. was my home like? And I thought, if I tell them, describe the house I live in, because I know people, whether people want to be honest about it or not, they have stereotypes of who you are right. and what, what you should have or not. And so um, rather than talk about the home that I grew up in, I talked about the plants. The that, plants. The plants. The flora yeah, yeah, that were yeah. in our yard. We lived on a double lot, and I talked about the plants because a boxwood shrubbery is a boxwood shrubbery. Mm. And a walnut tree is a walnut tree, mm, whether mm. it's in the home planted <laughs> in an Asian, African-American, white, or Latino right. lot. Right. So I talked about the, fl the flora. Okay. And, um, you know, it was kind of like, wow, that was really a beautiful home. And not only did I talk about it, but they also had a, a gentleman named Tom Robinson who supplies a lot of the pictures for McMinimans and Harvey Rice who talked about right. some of the business community and mm -hmm. uh, something like that. But Tom Robinson showed pictures of the community and told the history of Albina and where Albina actually was located mm -hmm. to give the idea that Albina was not a ghetto. That there were nice homes, well taken care of lots, and these homes were not in distress, but they just came in and wiped every place out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it got the point across that people were very sh stunned and shocked mm -hmm. that, that this had gone on. So um, after Tim called me and sent me a couple of these emails, I said, so what are you going to do with this upswelling of support? And he says, well, I don't know. I said, well, I do. So let's get together and talk. So we yeah. got together. Um, I was teaching in Portland Public and had been working as at one of the Beacon schools 
and uh, Beacon School, meaning we were one of the first schools to use the program that they had, which was Courageous Conversations and Race. Okay. And I was um, quite taken with this program. It's uh, from a book by Glenn Singleton and Curtis Linton. And what the book sets out, it's principles and conditions for discussing race. Mm -hmm. And it was really amazing because I had a colleague that, the best way I could have described this person is, you know, they talk about the junior high mean girls. Mm -hmm. Well, this person was kind of a mean person, did not get that other people's, what other people's feelings were, but we presented something to the staff and this person got it mm -hmm. and was able to look outside of their mm -hmm. own perspective mm -hmm. and say, this is how people could feel. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so you know, what we presented was a picture of uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, and that's where I teach now, is at, where I was working was at Cesar Chavez. I'm, I'm always going to be a teacher in my heart. I know you. I know you. And so, uh, and you are now. so they, uh, we presented a picture of that, and we said, okay, so who are, who are the interest in this? So we listed all the interest, and then we divided up into groups, and we tried to look from that person's perspective, the mm -hmm. grower's perspective, mm -hmm. the police, the marchers, you know, who, what was their perspective? So that's, that's kind of what we did, and people got it. And so uh, from there, we were involved. It spread to the school district, and um, a person at one of the meetings said to me, you know, I don't think that my boss is being honest. Because this Tim now you tell me. No, no, this was this was in Portland Public. Oh, this person oh, was okay. saying, My boss is not being honest and I need to tell somebody this. My boss is saying that treatment of children of color at our school is this way and it's not. Treatment of teachers of color is this way at our school and it's not. And what I realize is that this is a great program, but it needs to be away from your paycheck. Hmm. If you if you put it with a person you need it with the connected with the paycheck to make people stop and look at it. Mm -hmm. But if you're really going to get change, you have to take it away from the paycheck mm -hmm. because if I know my paycheck's connected to me saying certain things and I'm going to say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what was happening over here. So I thought, well, we may, we need to do this in the community mm -hmm. to give people a chance to come and find out for themselves mm -hmm. and, and, you know, make that change and that growth. And it needs to be a subtle, unpressured opportunity for people to learn and grow mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so um i got with tim and got with maceo pettis who Maceo's, is yeah. um is the founder of uh, the organization uniting it was two organizations that to oregon united and um understanding racism and they came together to form uniting to understand racism okay. so maceo set up a six-week dialogue group i was a part of that and uh, got training as a facilitator for uur and then we started with race talks hmm. interesting good, in good. february three years ago wow well you know what i tell you what we, you, we've actually spent 30 minutes just oh, basically you're kidding. But, but you know we need to vet that much <laughs> Especially talking about racism, you know, it's not an easy deal. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break, okay. and we're going to actually get down to race talk, okay? All right. and, then, and then at the same time respond to maybe a solution, or i.e., give some sense of of, uh, of understanding okay. uh, the feelings of this article called "Close Encounters of the Racist Kind." And that's Sounds good. About. Sounds good. We'll take a short short break, folks. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
I guess we are back on, right? Yeah. Well, welcome back, folks, again. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I've even, we were even talking even during the break, if you will, and, and I got to share this with, 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 with you all because uh, Donna and I were just chatting a little bit about it and whatever, and she was thinking, we were talking about her presentation to Tim, whatever, and, and they're vetting her and going through this, this, that, and the other. And I guess one of the person that made the point about uh, the fact that I don't know whether or not this is something that fits one way or the other. I'd heard a comment once before about something comparable to that. And they said, well, it was only on, it's, this is not Black History Month. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you're very familiar with Black History Month. Okay. All right. So, yeah. so anyway, let's get down to seriousness again, folks. Okay. Again, we're, we're talking to Donna, Donna uh, Maxey. And um, again, we're t talking about basically... Uh, her program called Race Talks, and now we're going to get into Race Talks. Okay. okay? And, and then after we talked, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the article that appeared in the Oregon, because I'm sure people are anxious to get, get your feelings about the, what you felt about this particular art article okay. and a solution, if you will, okay. to the two guys that are really, they're really reaching out. They need help. Okay. I, I, I can see it and feel it. Okay. All right. Let's talk race talk. Let's go on. Let's um, uh, the one one thing we were talking about race talk. Talk about race talk. That's what we were, right? Race talk. Yes. Define um, it real quick, like, and then we'll just get right into some of the encounters you had. Well, race talks was started to open up to the community, mm -hmm. and I th I thought that McMinimans would be a great place for it. Okay. Um, I think it's great to meet over food. It's hard to be contentious when you eat because you get indigestion. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted a win-win activity for everyone. Um, my my win was endorphins because there was no money f in it for mm -hmm. me. All right. So okay. I come from a, a public service, community service family. Mm -hmm. And so this was just a continuation of how I was raised. Um, doing Mr. This. Maxie still was a businessman. Oh yeah, he was a businessman. He that, was a, yes, I do. I remember okay, that. Okay, but we're, right. we're going to be working on all getting right, some funding right. for okay, race talks. Right. Okay. But for the first three years, we've pretty much been no, living no, off okay. of ethers and endorphins. I got you. So, got you. Um, but anyway, McMinimans, um, I wanted it to be at McMinimans, and then McMinimans would get a new audience because if most of the audience at McMinimans was a white middle class, um, even though it was right there on Thirty Third and Kingsworth. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've opened it up. We meet uh, the second Tuesday, excuse me, at Kennedy School. Yeah, we meet the second Tuesday of the month in the gym from okay. 7 to 9 p.m. Okay. All ages are welcome. It's free of charge. Mm -hmm. People can come in at 6 o'clock, come in, meet other folks, talk, buy food, buy dinner, buy drinks. Uh, it's a brew and pub, mm -hmm. pub, brewery and pub. I always say that oh. wrong. And, um, and then Uniting to Understand Racism ran... Um, has been running six-week dialogue groups and training facilitators. Mm -hmm. So what was in it for them is that they would provide facilitators for the, the discussions. And what makes Race Talks a little bit different is that we have a topic. We have speakers or a film for the first hour. And then the second hour, the audience gets to That's sit right. in small okay. groups and talk. Okay. And in talks led by a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And I always tell folks that my job as a facilitator is to help them take their foot out of their mouth. Because okay. if you're talking about this topic, there's no way you can do it and not put your foot in your okay. mouth. Okay. Moi included. Oh, yeah. okay. and, um, and so my job is to help them take their foot out of their mouth and to keep other people from putting their foot somewhere else okay. on them. Okay. So it's, it's, it provides a safe environment for discussion about the topic. Okay. And we provide um, questions for the audience, you know, for the facilitator to lead in discussion. Mm -hmm. that they don't have to talk about those, mm -hmm. but we do provide some guide questions. Okay. And then we try to have a large group discussion afterwards. Sometimes we don't, sometimes people don't wanna go to the large group right. discussion. Right. They wanna continue to right. discuss at their tables. Okay. So um, it's it, we've been very successful. Our first one was um, <clears throat> February of, I think it was 2011, 2010. 2010, I, I forget which year it was. But anyway, we what had... What about January 8th? You said growing up multiracial in Oregon. Well, no, the very first one we did was uh, an introduction beyond the Oregon Trail. Oh, okay. And okay. so beyond the Oregon Trail was a curriculum that Uniting to Understand Racism pro uh, created for Portland Public Schools to tell the story of people of color who were who came to Oregon. And it's an eight week curriculum that was developed by Uniting to Understand Racism for Portland Public Schools hmm. to be taught at the junior high level. Wow. Then uh, we started the first year, the curriculum for the speakers were focused around the issue of uh, 
these are people of color 101 who mm -hmm. live in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And we invited each month various groups to come and, and talk. Um, my, one of my favorite months was the Asian, was the Asian, Asian okay. because <laughs> as they said, all these people are not Asian at home mm -hmm. where they live. They are either Indian or uh, Thai or Filipino or Chinese or Japanese, and they mm -hmm. came to the United States and they became Asians. Yeah, right, right. So, you know, I, I love that one. And, well, you and, know, as I, as I look at some of the topic areas, we're very interesting. Grow up multiracial in Oregon, very important piece, race and housing crisis, hate crimes in Oregon, the fluoride debate, law and racial ethnic profiling. That's a very important one. I think about Trevon Martin, interracial couples, health inequities and natural causes, microaggressions, small things can hurt, talking to our children about race, get acquainted, social and, and auction, race in the arts, no program, I guess this as further on down the road, right? Right. And then Race Talk 2, and that was interesting, uh, April 2nd, Beyond the Oregon Trail, that's what you just said. Right. right. May 7th, the, Af the African American Experience in Oregon, the Muslim and Middle Eastern Experience in Oregon, perspectives from lesbian and gay people of color in Oregon. I'm thinking about where the two individuals, were they there? No, we haven't had that. I actually, and it says yeah, so all topics are subject to change. Okay, so you, haven't for, you haven't had that one. No, for yeah. August 6th, what we did was we had the topic Trayvon Martin's death, oh, did you? a catalyst for change. And the whole idea, and some people talk got confused. Talk a little bit about that. You well, there were a number of people who thought we were going to talk and this about. this was at, where, where was this at? At Jefferson this High School. This was at Jefferson High School. Yes, okay. which okay. is a, uh, between, which is on commercial. Right. Um, between. Alberta and Killingsworth between people were concerned. commercial and people were concerned in the they, black community. They are, and so people are angry. And one of the things that I said to the audience is that Trayvon is dead. Okay. We cannot bring him back. Mm -hmm. And no amount of consoling is going to make his parents feel better. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is take that righteous indignation that we feel and do something to help the children who are here. Mm -hmm. And so um, I invited um, Teresa Rayford, who has um, organized um, a rally for Trayvon mm -hmm. after he was murdered. Uh, she had organized a rally where about a thousand people came up to Peninsula Park. Mm -hmm. um, and she spoke for a while and kind of talked about some of her activism in the community. And then um, we had organizations that work with African American youth come and give a five minute spiel about what they do. Mm -hmm. And I encourage the audience, sign up to work with these organizations. Okay. These children are here now. Mm -hmm. We don't want any more Trayvon Martins, but we can help the kids who are here. And one of the things that I pointed out to them, I had just come back from um, my sororities. Okay. My sororities. Um, 100th anniversary. I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, okay. and we have a sorority house over on Al Albina and yeah. Ainsworth, uh, the June Key um, yeah, center. Yeah. And what was so amazing to me, 100 years ago, 22, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old African American women got together and said, We want to form a social service, a social activist sorority. Okay. We don't yeah. want to be just social. Okay. We want to be service and activists. These women participated in the suffrage parade a hundred years ago, saying that women should have the right to vote when black folks didn't even have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And what I pointed out to the folks was this started with 22 women 100 years ago. Today there are over 250,000 members worldwide. And when I was in Washington, D.C. for our convention, there were 50,000 college-educated African-American women wow. roaming that city huge. wearing all huge. red, all black, or huge. all white. Huge. Huge. So just because what you're doing doesn't look like much right now right. does not mean it won't have an impact right. down the right. road. So right. sign up and work with these youth. So so they did, and, and, and it was a good turnout. Well, we had about 80 there? people who came okay. and um, about seven well, let organizations. Let me ask you a question. Was the media there? <clears throat> no, and part of that's my fault. I did not invite media. I, I, it has never occurred to me to do that. Okay. I, think, I mean, people would have liked it, i.e. some betting, if you will, within this area. So this was, a, it was an excellent opportunity. And I'll be right up front with you. I'm thinking about the Portland Observer newspaper more specifically right. and, and the Scanner newspaper. But even the Oregonian, you know, because people didn't know what to do. Like they were looking for solutions and answers. Right. Okay. All right.
now that we've talked a little bit about that. So piece, this next month we're doing the gay lesbian. Now you're going to do the gay lesbian. Yes, okay, in so, September. So now it will be very appropriate. You know, I'm, I'm not, you're going to probably. I'm going to call these gentlemen. Please call those gentlemen. They, they should participate. Yeah. And possibly call the Oregonian. Well, I won't call them to speak because race talks is particularly specifically about people of color. Okay. Oh. And so they are white. Yeah, but the kids are of color. Their kids are of color. Well. And and what I would love for them to do, that will be, this one about the gay lesbian experience okay. will be at Jefferson uh, September 3rd. And then September 10th at Kennedy School, we'll be discussing talking with your children about race. And okay. in light of Trayvon... Um, I thought we need to have some men come and talk about how they talk to their sons mm -hmm. about race. Mm -hmm. So I've invited three gentlemen, um, and I just went blank on this brother's last name. His first name is Michael. He's the director of the Urban League, and he's going to speak. He has grown children. He's African-American. Mm -hmm. uh, two of my former colleagues, uh, Jorge Mesa, who's Hispanic and has mm -hmm. a son, mm -hmm. and, and his son is in fifth grade, mm -hmm. and then uh, Eric Suela, who is white, and his son is in college. Mm -hmm. So I wanted these, and, and, and these are men that I know and respect, mm -hmm. and I wanted them to come and talk about how did they talk to their kids about race? What do they tell their sons? How have they dealt with it themselves? So I think that will be a really interesting, interesting perspective, and I will most certainly invite... Uh, Mr. Setterstein and his partner to come personally to make sure that they come and they get to hear some of what it is because this is a difficult talk. It, is, it is. In fact, when I, I'm thinking about looking at the, looking at your schedule, schedule and whatever, what about the governor? I mean, you know, he is the new state superintendent of public schools. I, if you will. I hadn't thought to invite I mean, him either. Racism, maybe maybe we should do that. I think you need to do that. Maybe. Well, we've had the attorney general when we talked about housing. The attorney general and a number of people from her office mm -hmm. came, and then we, when we had uh, racial profiling, the law and racial profiling, uh, Chief Reese came and spoke. Mm -hmm. We had a good turnout. We usually have at Kennedy School between we have 150 seats, mm -hmm. so I always tell people come early because they're usually filled up by. 6:30, and so we had. Well, I quit counting at 225. You know, I might add, you know, from the police standpoint, uh, profiling and whatever, we happen to have an African American union president. You might want to consider right. bringing him on board to chat about this issue because it's a tough job, you know, being an African American union president of Portland Public School, Portland Police. I mean, and, that's and, true. And I understand that the gentleman is very articulate. And uh, he, he's really good. And so I think it, it, reaching out to him, I think, would be a good thing. Well, we've been talking with uh, the, the Portland Police and with uh, the uh, Oregon Bar Association, and we're developing, and, and through Portland Public Schools, teachers get credit, two hours credit for continuing um, units. Portland Public gave us a, a, a grant, and they have done an amazing job, they along with Kennedy School, of doing in, in kind for, for putting on the program. Uh, providing p a place mm -hmm. at okay. no charge cool. and, okay. and all and so um, so Portland public teachers receive credit for f if they come up and ask yeah. for a certificate they can get professional credit for mm -hmm. coming here and to help with their recredentialing -re and um, also we've been talking with the bar association so that attorneys can get training mm -hmm. to come to race talks to talk to people find out what's going on as well as the police but you know you, you bring, we, we, we constantly talk about this racism aspect of it and it's, it's about communication <laughs> and education, right? right, and awareness and whatever. But when you think about the curriculum, in order to get those certificates, whether it be passing the bar, or if not that, or getting a, a teacher's certificate, it's not part of the curriculum. No, it isn't. And Why is that so? I mean, you, you went through that whole process. Did you see anything that talked about the whole issue of race in the... And, well, I think, you got, no, come on, now, because I I mean, I learned about race, but I learned about race from my in, parents. In school or something? From my parents. Well, not in college? From my parents. Well, from your parents? So let me say this not one more Mr. time. Maxie. From my parents. Not from Mr. Max. <laughs> 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 Mr. 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 I'll be black, my buddy, yeah. My buddy yeah, yeah but no, from okay. my parents. But I think that's a, that's an issue that we, that needs to be addressed. Well, it I needs think to be Henry part of the Ford curriculum. started this in this country. You know, when when Henry Ford, who developed the Ford car, you right, know, he right. one they used to have these assemblies with all of their workers, mm -hmm. and and I remember one particular one, and I saw a film of it that they had all the people who worked at the Ford factory, the different ethnic groups, uh, represented jump into this melting pot with their their ethnic costume on and then out of the melting pot came this american worker and mm. so from that what i developed was the concept and i think this country has some of it is that what we're what everyone is trying to be 
is this white American worker. You just happen to be a person of color or, you know, have an accent or whatever, but this is what you're working for is to fit into this box. Mm -hmm. And um, the concept of being proud of your ethnicity and being able to be an American is a relatively new concept in this country. I mean, African... Well, inclusion is a very... Another interesting subject that we can talk about. Too. Yes, it is. Okay, okay. All right. Now that we've gone through race talk, and you've sort of given us some, some ideas. Of, oh, and uh, I should tell you, there's an article, a great article in the. Um, you want to show that paper? Oh, this one right here. There's a great the article News. in the this Hollywood Star News. Observe, yes, one. it's the Hollywood Star News. Okay, it's uh, race talks, courageous conversations Hold continue. I'm sorry. And it, right it was. Um, you got a photo of us after. Right? See uh, it? That that's me in another State incarnation. News. Okay. All right. <laughs> Race talks, courageous conversations continue. Okay, you get that one. I got it. All right, good. Okay, yeah. And that's a really great demonstration, uh, 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 expose of race talks and what we do there. Okay. What was interesting for me reading it was to hear some of the comments that some of the participants have to mm. make because I don't get to hear those. Okay. Well, who participates in these these times? Who, who, who's attending? Whoever, like at the Jefferson, whoever at the Jefferson, walks in the door. At, at your Jefferson folk, at your Jefferson's uh, talks and whatever those last few, whatever race talks too, an aspect of it. Who was that? Give me a percentage. Well, a percentage. I'm, I'm actually I don't you. know. At Jefferson, we we had more people of color, more African Americans at Jefferson than we usually have, uh, but um, we've kept statistics. Ninety percent. No, no, we we have fifty percent. No, Bruce. Thirty percent. You're not gonna let me say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just <laughs> we uh, the breakdown is usually about sixty seven percent white. Okay. And um, and then that gives us thirty three percent people of color. Okay. And you say color, are you blacks or well, Asians or whomever? We have okay, I think the the largest group is African American. I think we have about twelve percent African American. Um, but the rest of it, it just depends on okay. what talk it is. Okay. I mean, when we had the talk about the Native American experience yeah. in Oregon, I mean, the audience was packed, and it was really interesting because you looked out at the audience, and it looked like an interracial crowd. Mm. But then when you said, how many, I, I asked the question, how many of the people here are Native American? They all looked white, didn't they? Looked white, looked Hispanic, looked black, yeah. Yeah. looked okay. Asian. Okay. Look, Native American. I mean, okay. they they encompass everything. But I mean, and, and a majority of the audience was yeah. when we have Hispanic. The majority yeah. of people are Hispanic. Yeah. So uh, it depends on when we have and when we had African American. We had a lot of African Americans that yeah. showed up. Okay. So it depends on who's speaking, okay. and and well, we tend Siobhan to. Martin thing. I'm sure that people did respond to that. Well, it was mostly white people. Mostly white. Who, it was mostly white people who okay. came. And I think, you know, um, and there were a lot of new people that I had never seen before. Mm. But um, people, are, people are really reaching out and hungering to have an well, opportunity to Well, that's why we're doing the show, talk. because in all due respect, we, we, we didn't have, I mean, until I met you yesterday, the last, last week, I, I wouldn't have known. See what I'm saying? Now, what about McMinimans? What are, what are your percentages? What are, what's your pool over there? Well, at McMinimans, that's that's where the statistics came in, the 67%. So, okay, okay. Yeah. So you got majority and white over there. I majority see. white. Um, but what I have seen at McMinimans for myself mm -hmm. is that since we've started race talks there, I have seen when I've gone in there, years ago when I go to McMinimans, mostly everybody in there was white and I was the only black face in yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Now I see a lot more people of color coming mm -hmm. in. And as one person of color said, I feel that I can come here and I can be comfortable. Mm. I don't have to worry about being rejected by mm. by the wait staff here. And so, uh, because that's still an experience here in Oregon. I mean, I've I've witnessed it myself personally yeah. in the last year at, at various yeah. places. Well, in all due respect, the, in, the, the the issue of interracial marriages that's a that's a major issue, and people are still struggling at time with that. that that's a struggle, you know. And so, I think discussing is good. I mean, I mean, that's, if you want to be a progressive, I mean, that's what it's all about, you know. You, you meet the one you love. Yeah. Well, you know, we had we had the mm -hmm. uh, program interracial couples, and and I, it was really interesting because I had a really tough time getting people to speak. No, oh. no one wanted to talk, mm. and so I I were, and there, were there couples there? There were two couples. They were both African American males and white females, mm -hmm. um, and I spoke because my former husband, my my child's father was uh, was white and Jewish. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting, but we got married in 1970. Mm -hmm. These folks got married much later. One couple had been married 35 years and the other 31. And um, so 
several people on their evaluations were very upset with what the folks had to say. Uh And I kind of chuckled because I know what they were waiting for was the horrible experiences that they had they had gone through and these folks hadn't gone through that um my husband and i had some experiences but they weren't horrific things Mm -hmm. but we were in northern california in 1970 he was white and jewish and a conscientious objector and i was the first and only black teacher in the (laughs) town and we lived in john birch country and, and, you know, we were kids. We, I, he, he was 23, I was 21. You know, did we face But you were a maxi, though. The, in Northern California, I, I was just a little, little little girl, literally a little girl I, I, in, in, a, in a small town. So we, we went through things that these folks, because not, they got together yeah, so much right, later, right, right. did not go through. Right, and right, so right. people were bored with what they had to say because they really didn't go into great detail mm-hmm. about the problems of being mm-hmm. interracial. The problems they have are being married being a man and a woman yeah. together and trying to work mm-hmm. through those. Mm-hmm. So, you know. It was good. Good, good. Hey, look, we got about five more minutes, and I want to make sure we give give the audience something back and we'll respond to this article right here. Okay. How do you respond to an article like this? Well, I think, you what? know, it, I, I think folks would have to read the article, and he shares it. This a, is in the Oregonian, folks. This was in the Oregonian. Sunday Oregonian, okay, in the commentary section. Again, it says, white dads, black kids, close encounters of the racist kind. Very interesting article. I think this article is, uh, as I like to say, I think these two gentlemen managed to be honorary black folks. Okay. And and understand what we as people of color go through. Um, they talk about mean things that the teacher did, how the child was, his child was suspended from kindergarten, told that he was going to be nothing and, and violent because he and another little boy had a broom fight, little white boy had a broom mm-hmm. fight. Well, the little white boy did get suspended or reprimanded, but his child got suspended and reprimanded and now is a miscreant for the rest of his life in preschool. Um, same kinds, of, just a number of experiences are very similar. And, you know, I, I, it reminded me of something that happened to myself in first grade. My first grade teacher slapped me because I was talking out of turn. She had told us to be quiet. And I had never been slapped before, so I was in hysterics for the rest of the day, and I went home and told my mother, and you know, God watches out for babies, fools, and his own, and I never questioned which one I am. So my mom didn't have the car, because she was ready to go up there and (laughs) grill that teacher a new body part. And uh, she wasn't able to go until the next day. My father refused to let bring the car home to her. He said, no, you calm down. (laughs) So she went back up, and she said to the teacher, um, whose name happened to be Mrs. Gold, said, do you slap your own children? She said, well, of course not. And my mother said, well, I don't slap mine either, and I think just as much of that little brown one in there as you do your little white ones at home. But in this woman's mind, there was a difference between me and her children Mm -hmm. because her children are white to be revered, and I was just a little black child, and and I guess in her mind she thought that I grew up being slapped and battered around. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, But... but I could give you oh, a parallel, a almost everything that has happened in this article, I could give you a parallel in my life, in my siblings' lives, in the lives of people I know. This is very typical of the things that people say and do around issues of race. And um, So what's the solution? Give me a solution. Well, the only solution I see in this world is when aliens come. Aliens. When aliens come to Earth, the human beings will stop looking at each other as different ethnic or racial groups. That's the only time it's going to happen. <laughs> because we'll be so terrified, you know, that we need to group together. And so, so you know, if, if I'm falling off a cliff, do I care if it's a white hen or a black hen that mm-hmm. saves me? Or do I just want to be saved? I mean, I think it's that kind of thing. We, you know, and, and it's unfortunate. And I mean, if you look in... In Africa, where you have the Hutus and the, um, oh, I remember there was the Hutus and, and I, uh, Tutsis. Tutsis, and it was, you could, I couldn't tell what the, who they were. They were both black people. They both looked very similar, but they were different. And I remember this one incident where the soldiers came through and the, the father was of the same ethnicity as the soldiers, and they told him, you either kill your wife and kids or we'll kill them. And you, when we kill him, we're really, you know, we'll rape all of them and do all these mm-hmm. horrible things. He ended up having to kill his family in order to spare them. But these are people who look alike. 
Think about Ireland, where the people all looked alike, the Catholics and the Protestants. How could you tell? Was there a C or a P on your forehead? I mean, you know, it's that kind of thing. This is part of the mammalian hierarchy, the, the, the pecking order, and race just happens to be a convenient way to do it. Because I can look at you and you look different from me, and so it's convenient to, to use that as a divider. Whereas another thing we don't want to talk about in this country is class. Mm -hmm. When you have people who all look alike, then you have to look at issues of class. So it's... What about gender? Gender is an issue. Um, it, it was really interesting. We were, um, I, what's her, Dr. Joy Leary? and that's not what she goes by now as Larry, but anyway, she, she was speaking and she was saying, how did they tell time before, before they had clocks? And I'm like, don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, they told time by a woman's, woman's menstrual cycle. Mm. And so it's like, okay. And she said, so you're going to have to learn to subdue the person that has all the power. So you have issues of power and you have to subvert that power. If, if I've got all the, I'm the one who knows how to count, mm -hmm. and you don't, then how do we equalize that, you know? So it's, it's just part of the pecking order, and race is just a really convenient way to do it. Mm -hmm. Donna, this is very interesting, and hopefully, uh, hopefully the viewing audience got some sense of solution, right? Donna's shared it with you, and, and I, would, I would think, and I'm sure she would probably go along with this, and that is uh, discuss it. Sit around the table and discuss it. And in fact, uh, maybe you want to keep her in mind and go to some of these uh, these talks, these race talks. Race talks. Race the talks, first right? Tuesday of the month at Jefferson High School from 6.30 to 8.30. And uh, the second Tuesday of the month at McMinniman's Kennedy School from 7 to 9 p.m. That sounds good. And how do they get in touch with you again? Uh, they can call me or they okay. can, um, the email address is racetalksdonna at gmail.com. Okay. Phone number if you want. My phone number is 971-222-8254. Is it my understanding that it's a non-profit? You're a non-profit at this point in time? Pardon me? You're a non-profit too. Then. Uh, we are working under the, uh, the aegis of the World Arts Foundation. We okay. were under Uniting to Understand Racism, and now we're under World Arts Foundation, and okay. we'll be working to get our own non-profit status this next year. Okay, sounds good. Don, any lasting comments? Any lasting points that you Just might want to make? be open and talk. Sounds great. Be open and talk and love, your, love yourself and love your neighbors. Donna, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Folks, thank you very much. And again, sit around the table, chat about this. I'll see you next week. Talk to you.